pretty silly there Did on telly, did dear Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère De mon jardin d'hiver Jim, shifting to you, will there, when you talk about compromise, and this is the year that there has to be compromise, where will Democrats find it? And then will that be perceived as, because everyone wants the victory that they can crow about heading into the midterms when people head to the polls, who gets the win if you come to a compromise? That always seems to be the, the challenge in Washington. Nobody wants to give the other side a victory. Right. Well, both sides in on this and both sides have to get a loss on this. Mm -hmm. Look, the Republicans have a problem. They're going into the midterms. Their approval rating, you know, wouldn't melt an ice cube. So they're, you know, they're looking at a bloodbath in 2018. And 2017 was a year in which Republicans really did not look to Democrats for help. They tried to, they did everything on their own. There needs to be a change. The signal needs to come from President Trump. And it's got to be more than words. It's got to be deeds. He, you know, he had the deal with Chuck and Nancy in September, and then he backed off. He really needs to reach out to Democrats. He needs to move to the center. They can do something on infrastructure. They can do something on spending. They can do something on immigration. It's not outside of his power, but he has to do it. And he's got to force Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan to move his caucus a little bit as well. Jim, interesting. You just mentioned a bloodbath. We have heard a lot of analysts talk about a potential blue wave, uh, Brad, going into 2018. So does that make this year, before a potential blue wave, even more important for Republicans as far as what they can get done? Absolutely. Uh, they need to run on their record. We control every facet of government, the White House and both houses of Congress. So it's incumbent upon us to have a record that we can run on. And that history is against us in the midterm. Since the Civil War, we've lost on average 32 seats in the House and, and two in the Senate. So history is not with us, but math is. Democrats are defending a lot more uh, races, both House and Senate, and putting more money and spreading their resources then. So if we have a good record, I think we'll be rewarded by the electorate come November. And Jim, the final word, are, are there any concerns, uh, Democrats could be seeing a lot of victories coming up, that they could be complacent going into this election year? I don't think you'll see Democrats be complacent. And one of the things you saw both in the Virginia race, in uh, governors where Democrats won the governorship, and in Alabama where Doug Jones won, is in these blue and, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, purple and red states, mm -hmm. Democrats nominated moderates. And if they are nom nominating moderates in purple and red areas, in congressional districts and in Senate seats, they could have a very, very successful election in 2018. You know, that is a broad path that they're taking. So I think Democrats feel optimistic about 2018. They ought to. That doesn't mean you can't get things done this legislative session. It is Tuesday. January 2nd of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. It is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. That's our daily special. And it coming on the day after New Year's Day seems appropriate. Um, I don't know why it is. It just seems that way. And so there it is. Well, I hope that you had a fantastic New Year's. Uh, I'm expecting great things for 2018. Uh, as evidence, really, by the uh, clip at the top uh, as you entered here into the bistro and sat in the front cafe here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Uh, that was uh, Jim Kessler uh, of Third Way, the Third Way, uh, explaining to Fox News that, uh, yes, there will be a bloodbath in 2018 and GOP will be suffering that. 
and um, so I expect big things. Um, many people expect uh, Trump to well leave office in 2018, and I think it's going to be more like 2019 because you have to vote the ne- Democrats in first, and then we can have the hearings, the investigation, uh, what what we used to call. The normal rule of law. All right. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I, lots of news happened over the weekend, of course, uh, but we didn't get into a nuclear war. And that was, uh, I was wondering if that was going to be the case. Can you imagine the ball dropping with that hanging over your head? I would want to be at Times Square. In fact, how many people were at Times Square on New Year's Eve? It's bitterly, it was what, 15 below zero? And it's still bitterly cold. And uh, stay warm. Don't go out unless you really have to. Okay? Okay. Well, uh, let's take a look at what we will be attending to today. Uh, we did a mashup yesterday. A little holiday special for you. and But we're back with news that's not only locally sourced. We bring it in from all around the world. Fresh, fresh, fresh. That's right. All right, this is what's on the menu for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy as we begin things here in the Front Cafe. Voter fraud czar Chris Kobach whines that lawsuits are slowing down his voter suppression efforts. Darn. Attorney General Jeff Sessions takes a stand for debtors' prisons. Uh, there's been such a outcry over, uh, people being jailed for being in debt. Jeff Sessions thinks that's a good idea. Hmm. Well, wouldn't you think he would? And Trump urges the Department of Justice to jail Jim Comey, Clinton aide Huma Abedin, and others, unspecified others, after a Fox News report on New Year's Day. Hmm. I guess he wasn't golfing the whole time. And after the break, we'll move to the chef's table where we will examine why chemicals in America are woefully unregulated. And too much screening has misled us about real cancer risk factors. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. All right, as we're settling in here in the front cafe, uh, I want to remind you if you would just uh, open your menu, and that would be on uh, any device that you happen to be uh, listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with, and go to uh, netrootsradio.com. That would be our homepage. And uh, scroll to the bottom, you'll notice the chat room link. And that is one way to engage with us. Uh, Rowing Girl, Kelly Lincoln, our Kelly Lincoln, uh, does monitor that uh, uh, quite frequently during the day. And you might even catch her when she's on. And uh, if you cast your eyes to the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom of the homepage, you will notice the donate contribute buttons. Uh, I just paid a bunch of bills yesterday. Well, I didn't really. It, it took it out automatically. Isn't that amazing? And uh, uh, this is how we were able to keep the radio station going here at Netroots Radio. And we do it because of your fantastic and generous generosity. And we do truly and sincerely thank you for that. Oh, and you can contact me at Justice Putnam on Twitter. And also on Daily Co's, I'm known as Justice Putnam. And uh, just look for me there. And uh, if you want to contact me there, you can. All right. Okay. So uh, this first uh, item on the menu that we have out here now is by the great Sarah K. Burris. Kansas gubernatorial hopeful Chris Kobach has used Donald Trump's so-called voting voter rights panel to try and restrict the Voting Rights Act and weaken access to the ballot. Now he's whining that the lawsuits trying to prevent his voting limits are just a little too much. Don't you know I'm a czar? And when I say if something happens, it happens. That's sort of like a mashup of Germanic and Russian. I, I don't know how it happened. It just does sometimes, especially right after New Year's Day. 
Now, according to the Topeka Capital Journal, the commission was scheduled to meet in January, but the work they've attempted to do so far has been hit with roadblocks. I think January being this month. I am not aware of any presidential commission that has encountered so much litigation from special interest groups, Kobach lamented. And he ought to know because he he represents one of the most profound and powerful special interest groups outside of the NRA, and that would be Alec. In fact, he might even be Alec. Now, Trump started the commission in efforts to prove how three million people voted illegally, and then he actually won the popular vote. Because that's what uh, demagogues do. Putin did. He wins with 90-some-odd percent, and people hate that guy. And he wins with 90-some percent. So how can 3 million people not vote for him and vote for the witch? You know, a lot of people still call her a witch. And some of them are on our side. Well, (laughs) let's just put it this way. Those are put at bay. Most of the past few months has been spent by commission staff answering discovery requests for information and drafting affidavits and things like that. No, oh, darn it, I forgot to get into my Chris Kobach accent. Oh, well, just bear with me. Going through the legwork of litigation, and, and that takes time, Kobach whined. We have a very small staff in Washington, D.C., and that staff has been bogged down in litigation. <laughs> Well, you know, when you're trying to shrink government down to the size of a bathtub, you might need it, you know, more than just a couple of burly guys to pick up the bathtub with the dead body of government in it, won't ya? In one case, the commission demanded the voting records and information of all voters in every state. <laughs> However, many states refused, while other states only gave partial data. A bipartisan group of secretaries of state refused, insisting there was no reason for it. When another lawsuit, the so-called Bipartisan Commission, uh, is alleged to have shut out Democratic member Matthew Dunlap, the secretary of state for Maine. The complaint explains he had no choice but to bring the suit as an action of last resort to enable him to fulfill the oath he took and the obligations to which he committed when he joined the commission. Now, remember, uh, there was some scuttlebutt on whether any Democrats or anybody from the Democratic side should even sit on this commission. And it was decided we got to have somebody because they're going to do what they're going to do and they're going to ram it through anyway. So we might as well at least have a, you know, like a boom, a bump in the road. Okay, thus far, eight lawsuits have gone to federal court in opposition of the commission's demands or findings. Plaintiffs rage from the ACLU to the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. The Cap Journal quoted Washburn political science professor Bob Beatty, who claimed no other commission has seen such a pushback. The reactions to Kobach have been swift and furious, not just by interest groups, but by states. Yes, just, you know, and, and, and you would think, the states might have standing in a court of law. But that's only if you can uh, get past uh, the voluminous amount of of Federalist Society Trump appointees who seem to have a very different idea about how our system of checks and balances work. The Federalist Society, you think that they would be, you know, like Madison, Hamilton, and John Jay. However, most presidential commissions are a means of research or a body to bring findings and proposals to a president. Few have any real power outside of the advice given to that president. One from 2010 was called the Interagency Task Force on Veterans Small Business Development. Another from the George W. Bush administration was a Commission on the Future of the United States Aerospace Industry. President Ronald Reagan established one in 1987 called the President's Commission on the HIV Epidemic, which President Bill Clinton reestablished in 1995. Kobach's commission, by contrast, has been given an open authority to determine lawsuits and make demands of state leaders to essentially prove a hoax. Fake news. 
That's called fixing the news. Or we might call it propaganda. Very interesting. Okay, this next item on the menu here is by Nusrat Chaudhry, uh, a staff attorney with the ACLU writing for the ACLU. During the holiday season, many of us think about what we can do to help people struggling with poverty. Attorney General Jeff Sessions, on the other hand, decided just before Christmas to rescind a guidance meant to protect low-income Americans. The 2016 guidance issued by former President Obama's Justice Department urged state and local courts nationwide to abide by constitutional principles prohibiting the jailing of poor people who cannot afford to pay court fines and fees. Constitutional principles. I will, I will repeat that. Constitutional principles. Jeff Sessions' action makes clear that he and his Justice Department are unconcerned by courts trampling on the rights of poor people. The Obama Justice Department issued the 2016 letter after reports and lawsuits by the ACLU and other groups revealed how modern-day debtors' prisons function in more than a dozen states, despite the fact that the U.S. two centuries ago formally outlawed jailing people simply because they have unpaid debts. Well, I don't know. I think the only thing that, that, that stands from the original constitutional guarantees is they haven't really started quartering, quartering troops in our homes yet. Yet. Just watch. Okay. Uh, these efforts reveal that poor people were being locked up in Georgia, Washington, Mississippi, and elsewhere without court hearings or legal representation when they could not pay fines and fees for traffic tickets or other civil infractions or criminal offenses. These efforts also show that modern-day debtors' prisons result from state laws allowing or requiring the suspension of driver's licenses for unpaid court fines or fees without first requiring confirmation that the person could actually pay. Take away their car, take away their job, throw them in jail. Debtor's prison sounds surprising like, surprisingly like, uh, what's the term now? It's, it's just right on the tip of my tongue. Oh, a for-profit prison system. Suspiciously smells like it. Ugh. Now, modern-day debtors prisons received unprecedented national attention in 2015 when the DOJ issued a 185-page report in its investigation of the Ferguson Police Department after the shooting of teenager Michael Brown. It documented how Ferguson police sought to advance the, quote, city's focus on revenue rather than public safety needs, end quote, leading to the routine incarceration of poor people to elicit court fine and fee payments, which raised due process concerns and reflected racial bias. Not only a for-profit prison system, but whole municipalities are dependent upon extracting fees, fines, jail. You know, people don't just go to jail. They got to pay to be in jail now. Well, it just shows that they have skin in the game. You know, they, otherwise they would just sit there. Okay, these uh, wave of attention on draconian debtors' prisons spurred the Department of Justice to issue the 2016 letter on fines and fees. Prior to rescinding the letter and other Obama era guidances, the Attorney General claimed that such documents constitute overreach and impose new obligations on parties outside the executive branch. But that is not what the DOJ letter on fines and fees did. The Obama Justice Department showed leadership by reminding state chief justices and court administrators that the U.S. Constitution's promises of due process and equal protection apply when courts impose and collect fines and fees. Far from creating new policy, the letter cited case law 
from the U.S. Supreme Court and other courts in support of seven constitutional principles. Among the most basic of these principles is the fact that the 14th Amendment prohib- prohibits jailing people for non-payment of court fines and fees without safeguards, including a hearing before a neutral judge to determine one's ability to pay and meaningful alternatives to jail people who cannot pay. Sessions' withdrawal of the letter on fines and fees cannot rescind these principles or the case law on which they are based, nor can it stop the ongoing momentum behind the reform of modern-day debtors' prisons in places like Biloxi, Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio, Michigan, and New Hampshire. Several weeks ago, a federal court ruled that New Orleans judges faced a conflict of interest in jailing poor people for unpaid fines because the judges control the money collected and rely on it for court funding. Might I interject that this this uh, stain of corruption is rampant throughout our whole system, apparently. At least a particular mindset of a system that would do these behaviors. Asset forfeiture is another way of extracting money out of the civilian population to fund a paramilitary organization called that local police department. Okay. There is no place in this country for a system that lets rich people buy their freedom while poor people are locked up or lose their driver's licenses because they cannot afford to pay money to courts. The momentum for change will continue even as the Department of Justice declines to lead by encouraging fairness and equal treatment of rich and poor. The the very, very rich, and then there's the not-so-very-rich, and that's the spectrum we're going to have. The not-so-very-rich, I I think they only have like a few hundred million dollars. They are the poor people, and we, we don't exist. We're not even a blip. We're barely the mosquito buzzing in their ear, which is exactly how they think about us. They think that we are the bloodsuckers, and that it's not them. Well, uh, there will be a comeuppance, and way before the pearly gates, believe me. All right, our last dish here in the front cafe uh, at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays is brought to you by Travis Geddes from Raw Story. Donald Trump who blabbed classified intelligence to top Russian officials in the Oval Office, by the way, when our press was not allowed, but the Russian press was. Remember that? Reacted to a Fox News report this morning by calling to jail a Hillary Clinton aide for allegedly emailing sensitive government information. Actually, this was uh, uh, a news story on Fox News yesterday morning. The conservative network highlighted a story Monday morning from the right-wing Daily Caller website. Oh, good. I see bow ties in my head, and it just makes me really mad. Which reported that Clinton aide Yuma Abedin forwarded sensitive State Department emails, including passwords to government systems to her personal Yahoo email account. Well, there's some speculation on whether that actually happened. Well, that email service provider was later hacked, and the Daily Caller reported that guarantees that Aberdeen and Clinton exposed sensitive government data to a state-sponsored actor. Now, of course, there are people in Trump's group who have already pled guilty to, how how shall we, uh, uh, I, I think they exposed more than sensitive government data to a state-sponsored actor. Let's be clear about this. Well, uh, Trump urged the Justice Department, which he slurred as a deep state conspiracy against his presidency, to prosecute and jail Abedin. Oh, man, we're we're right past Banana Republics and, I don't know, smack dab, uh, well, maybe at Gorky Park. 
Wee. Trump also suggested that former FBI Director James Comey, whom he fired in May after failing to receive an assurance of loyalty, should also be prosecuted along with unspecified others. I think the unspecified others might uh, uh, fill up a couple of sports stadiums so that you could like interrogate them, uh, smash their their hands with hammers. And then, I don't know, eventually torture them and then shoot them in the head. Or drop them from, like, uh, helicopters uh, about 1,500 feet up into shark-infested waters. We used to do that. Oh, well, we didn't. The, the uh, uh, what, the University of the Americas, they, they, they taught people how to do that. Now, we're just, he, he pines for when we can do it ourselves. Why use a middleman? They're talking about efficiency here. The day after Trump fired Comey, he met in the Oval Office with Russian Foreign Minister and U.S. Ambassador at the center of the Justice Department's investigation of the president's campaign ties to Kremlin. Trump told the Russian officials about how ISIS terrorists were working to develop a laptop bomb that could pass undetected through airport security, which he boasted had come from Israeli intelligence officials. This guy just loves giving state secrets. In fact, what's this Pakistani thing that he talked about here? Where did he hear about that? That wasn't on Fox News. That was from one of his intelligence briefings. And he couldn't wait to to let that one out. The information was highly classified and had, uh, had not been shared with close U.S. allies. And experts believe... The disclosure put the Israeli spy operation at risk. Not only that, but there's reports that people died. Last week, Trump gave a rambling interview to the New York Times, which asked whether he intended to reopen the Justice Department's investigation of Clinton's email activity as Secretary of State. Responding, I have absolute right to do what I want to do with the Justice Department. No, you don't. You're not a dictator. You're the president of the United States. And, uh, you know, the little mosquitoes in your ear, the blood suckers, <laughs> you're going to find out we're the sleeping bear. And you don't wake the sleeping giant bear. All right. Let's head off to our break and uh, we'll move everything back to the chef's table and uh, finish up with the rest of the menu there. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. It's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetRootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution and you'll get a wondrous pair of Netroots radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. The Justice Department is free-form and eclectic, an ever-changing embrace of culture from around the world, a refuge from the bombast, a place to quiet the soul and feed the mind. Not restricted by any structure or wall, the Justice Department is music without borders. Listen to the Justice Department on the Netroots Radio Network. Sundays, 8 to 9 p.m. Pacific, 
Check the program schedule for replays of past shows. You are listening to Netroots Radio Network. For playlists and other information to the Justice Department, Music Without Borders, go to www.dailycos.com backslash blog backslash Justice Putnam. Every decade or so, America's mass media are surprised to discover that migrant farm workers are still being miserably paid and despicably treated by the industry that profits from their labor. Stories run, the public is outraged again, assorted officials pledge action, then nothing changes. News reports recently have redocumented that the shameful abuse of these hard-working, hard-traveling families continues. A Los Angeles Times report revealed that even if they receive the legal minimum wage, many farm laborers earn less than $17,500 a year because of the low pay and the seasonal nature of their work. Moreover, they're often housed in shacks, old chicken coops, shipping containers, and squalid motels. This year, though, multi-billion dollar agribusiness interests from Florida to California are uniting in a push for new assistance, not for workers, but themselves. While they back Trump for president, many are now expressing shock that he may actually try to fulfill his campaign promise to cut off the flow of undocumented immigrants to their fields. They now admit that these immigrants make up as much as 70% of the industry's workforce. So they've rushed to Washington, demanding a special exemption from their president's planned lockout of Mexican laborers. In the process, they've suddenly recharacterized the very migrants they've been so callously mistreating as noble employees who are essential to the USA's food security. This is Jim Hightower saying, Big Ag deserves no special break at all. But if Trump and Congress give any help to them, they should be required to pay a living wage, provide decent family housing and health care, and treat all farm workers with the respect due to people who really are essential to our food security. To help push for basic human justice, connect with the United Farm Workers at UFW.org. If you like these feisty pops of populism that Hightower zings out on the airwaves, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter provides the in-depth lowdown on what the greed heads of Wall Street and the bone heads of Washington are doing to us behind the scenes. With Hightower's saucy Texas humor and truth-telling populist perspective, the lowdown literally can lift you up. And get this, you can have the lowdown delivered to your mailbox or email each month for only $15 a year. Yes, 12 issues, only 15 bucks. Check it out, HightowerLowdown.org. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. When it snows this winter, make sure you clear more than your driveway. Before you hit the road and before you get in the driver's seat, check to be sure that your vehicle's tailpipe is clear of snow. If the tailpipe is blocked, carbon monoxide, an odorless, colorless, and deadly gas produced by your engine can build up quickly inside your vehicle, poisoning anyone inside. To learn more, call 1-800-CDC-INFO. That's 1-800-232-4636. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. Bats are sophisticated communicators, and not just when they're in vampire form. I am Dracula. New research finds that Egyptian fruit bats actually have regional dialects, depending on the bat chatter that surrounds them as they grow up. The study's in the journal PLOS Biology. Among humans, one person's is another one's Good night. Wild populations of bats also display group-specific vocalizations. But how do these vocal characteristics arise? Do they reflect innate genetic differences, or are they learned? And if bat accents are acquired, who are these furry flyers imitating? Their parents or their roost mates? To find out, Yossi Yuval at Tel Aviv University and his colleagues captured 15 pregnant fruit bats and divided them into three groups, 
each of which was housed in its own separate box. The mothers gave birth inside these boxes, and their babies, called pups, lived there for a full year. During that time, the researchers exposed the pups to a select symphony of bat sounds. Fruit bats in the wild are reared in colonies that contain dozens to thousands of individuals, so they're used to being surrounded by a cacophony of calls and other vocal communiques. For one of the boxes, Yuval and his team exposed the young batlings to a selection of squeaks that were biased toward the higher frequencies. Pups in the second box heard lower-pitched peeps. And the third box got a random sampling of fruit bat hits that was heavy on the mid-range frequencies, but also included those at either end of the oral spectrum. And what we found is that they were influenced by the playback that they heard. Yossi Yuval. So the control f- uh, group was using a vocal repertoire that was identical to the mothers and identical to fruit bats uh, in, in the colony uh, here in Israel. But the two uh, manipulated groups were using different dialects. We actually were able to create three different groups of fruit bats with three different dialects in the lab. Of course, birds are famous for their songs, which the males learn from tutors, typically their dads. But Yuval says when it comes to vocal learning, bats march to a different drummer. Here we show that even though the pups were with their mothers and they were exposed to their mother's normal repertoire, they were still influenced by the background uh, vocalizations that they heard. Now, this is probably extremely uh, reasonable in the case of bats, because bats roost in these caves with uh, uh, many hundreds of individuals. We believe that this process, which we call crowd vocal learning, because you learn from the entire crowd, is relevant um, for many other animals that live in crowded colonies. As the researchers note in their paper, this sort of social learning is sometimes called culture, even if you're living in a cave. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. In the most recent podcast, we discussed how baby bats learn their calls from all the other bats in their crowded colonies. And we mentioned in passing that songbirds usually get tutored directly from their dads. So how does that avian system work? At about 25 days, the father starts singing, in many cases, directly to the juvenile. David Metz, a geneticist at the University of California, San Francisco. That sort of is the onset of what's called the sensory phase of learning, where uh, they incorporate information from their environment. What Metz and his team wanted to know was how much of a baby bird's future musicality is influenced by that tutoring, an environmental factor, and how much is written in their genes. So they studied Bengalese finches, which sing like this. The tempo of that song appears to vary according to a finch's genetics. So they tried training baby finches with different genetic tendencies, fast, medium, or slow singing, on a synthetic finch song made from a library of different types of song syllables. So these are sort of, they'd be tonal downward sweeps, so, you know, or sort of broadband noisy ones like shh. But when baby finches with different genetic backgrounds were trained on the resulting tune, the training didn't stick. Instead, the greatest predictor of their singing tempo was the way their fathers sang, which they'd never heard. So their genes seemed to be in charge. But then Metz flipped the experiment exposing genetically similar birds to actual live birds that sang fast, medium, or slow. And that live training appears to have been compelling enough to override the influence of the bird's genetics. So that genetically identical chicks sang tunes fast, medium, or slow, depending what their tutor sang. The results are in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The study suggests that the right kind of schooling, or environmental influences, might be able to overcome baked-in genetic influence on certain traits. And Metz says this push-pull of nature versus nurture might hold true for humans, too. You know, we're moving very rapidly into a period where genetic data is easier and easier to collect. And an understanding of these kinds of gene-environment push-pull interactions and how they impact ultimate phenotypic outcomes is going to be important in understanding things like, you know, even, say, cancer susceptibility. Because that, too, has both genetic and environmental factors. But no word yet on whether the genetic influences of an off-tempo human father can be conquered with enough training. Thanks for listening. 
for Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Settle in here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. We've broken everything down in the front cafe, down to its uh, rather sedate, uh, but uh, maybe upscale cookbook uh, camouflage that we use to hide the speakeasy part. And that's where the chef's table is, because uh, you might have a little bit of uh, illicit activity happening here, uh, meaning that uh, we may discuss... Uh, those issues that in more authoritarian governments, in which we could soon become, uh, would be, well, illicit. But before we get into that, we like to have a little palate cleanser, so to speak, and that is the weather. So along uh, the banks of the Rogue River, the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, it is currently 35 degrees. Uh, weather Underground says that we're slated for a high of 57, but we haven't broke 50 yet. In the last, well, quite a while, and certainly the last several days, when the weather underground over the weekend kept saying that we were going to be in the mid-50s, we didn't break 50. So I doubt very much that we'll get to 57. Uh, we do look like we'll have, well, what I consider to be uh, uh, favorable weather. It's it's so not so favorable now. We do have an air stagnation advisory and a dense fog advisory. It's not so dense exactly here where I'm at uh, in Rogue River, but uh, in the surrounding areas, it is quite foggy, so I should take care until that lifts. Uh, looks like uh, pressure is still low at 30.29 inches. Visibility is down to five miles, and uh, I think it's actually less than that if I were to get to the pass. And uh, humidity is at 79%. We're going to have fairly dry conditions except for the ambient moisture in the air from the fog. And uh, But we do expect to have uh, a fair amount of rain coming towards the end of the week. All right. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. And these people live around the world. Okay. Uh, London is 51 degrees with scattered clouds. Paris is 46 degrees and overcast, though they are still under a wind advisory that may uh, impact electrical infrastructure. Rome is under that same wind advisory. They are at 56 degrees and clear. Kiev is 37 and overcast. Kabul, 51 with haze. Hong Kong is 68 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 43 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 70 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 53 degrees and mostly cloudy. And New York, New York is a bitterly cold 16.8 degrees Fahrenheit and clear. So it's, they're not going to tell you it's 17 degrees. They're going to tell you 16.8 just to rub it in. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they have purchased. And these people live around the world. First dish here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is an excerpt adapted from Michelle Perot and Vincane Adams' new book, What's Making Our Children Sick? How Industrial Food is Causing an Epidemic of Chronic Illness and What Parents and Doctors Can Do About It by Chelsea Green Publishing. The concerns raised by env environmental health scholars are similar to those raised by researchers looking at pesticides. Most people would be surprised, however, to learn there is a shocking lack of rigorous testing and regulation of chemicals in the United States. Well, some would be shocked. Others would see that this has uh, been an issue, and it's only getting worse with this administration. 
Well, one would expect our food supply to be well regulated, but in far too many cases, the three federal government government agencies that bear responsibility for some aspect of food safety have not been exercising adequate oversight. These agencies are the FDA, the USDA, and the EPA. Okay. Oh, three agencies targeted by targeted by the Trump administration for massive cuts and in in uh budget and staff. Yes. Now, the FDA has been granted the major role and it is supposed to be exercising great precaution. I don't know. I thought the idea was to use us as the guinea pigs, check in after 10 years, see how many people are dying. And if there's too many people dying, definitely don't let anyone know because that might hurt profits. According to the stipulations of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, this agency must ensure that all new additives to our food that do not have a safe history of use prior to 1958 are demonstrated to be safe via standard scientific testing before they're allowed on the market. In cases where sufficient technical evidence of safety has already been produced, and this evidence is well recognized among experts, the new additive can be deemed to be generally recognized as safe, and the manufacturer is not required to produce additional evidence. So the term generally recognized as safe is actually a professional term known as grass. Generally recognized as safe. Do you have enough grass? Give me some grass. But these precautionary safeguards have been violated when it comes to genetically engineered foods. As a public interest attorney, Stephen Drucker has revealed in his book, Alter Genes, Twisted Truth, even the FDA has acknowledged that various pieces of DNA inserted into genetically engineered organisms are within the purview of these laws. It has claimed they are exempt from testing because they are grass, generally recognized as safe, despite the fact his own files demonstrate the agency knew that neither of the requirements for grass status had been satisfied. Now, I I do need to confess a certain ambivalence in the argument about genetically modified foods. I go back and forth on it. Usually, I go back and forth on it because of specific aspects of genetically modified or altered foodstuffs, etc. So, uh, um, I, I fear sometimes that our fear of genetically altered or modified um, foodstuffs, et cetera, et cetera, might be part of a, a hysteria. Because uh, if I trust scientists, you know, great numbers of them, I, I, I think the number would be like in climate science, isn't it something like 98% or 99% even? So that's the consensus among 98, 99% of scientists. So uh, if they have a consensus that uh, climate change, uh, anthrop anthropomorphic, uh, you know, where humans are the main driver and cause of climate change, if that's a consensus, I, I accept that. And uh, there is quite a large consensus. What is it? I don't know, maybe like 80, 90 plus percent of scientists. Um, deem the vast majority of genetically modified and altered foodstuffs, etc., as being generally regarded as safe. But I don't want uh, insecticide-resistant uh, seeds or whatever blowing from somebody's field onto my field because I'm not using insecticides on my field. Oh, and I don't like drift from insecticides coming to my field in the first place. But no one thinks about me or the little guy. Uh, so the USDA, USDA, the oldest of the three institutions, was established in 1862, regulates agrochemicals and the ways that farmers grow crops or raise livestock and poultry. 
and the EPA was established in 1970 with a more general and loosely defined responsibility to protect human health and the environment based on monitoring, standard setting, and enforcement. And in 76, Congress passed the Toxic and Substance Control Act, which gave the EPA full power to control chemicals that posed a health risk to humans in the environment. But have they? And I don't know. I, I, I suppose it's important to put this in a book. Be, but, but I would say, no, they haven't. And we have ample evidence to prove that they have been woefully inadequate in regulating. And in many cases, I think that we have turned from the consumers to the guinea pigs. Well, whether consumers and the guinea pigs. Isn't that nice? Okay, we'll finish up here at the chef's table uh, at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays with an article out of Stat Magazine, the uh, magazine that uh, publishes articles about medicine. And this is penned by Sharon Begley. Uh, now, too much screening has misled us about real cancer risk factors. Experts say that. I visited with my family practitioner just this last week. And I was reminded of something that I've absolutely tried to avoid, and that is the susceptibility that we have to uh, to be gullible. Isn't that true? I mean, why why are pharmaceuticals that we don't have any idea what they are or what they do, but they're advertised for us to go bug our doctors about it? So we're so highly susceptible to suggestions. And I see it as a caregiver in my own home. And uh, so uh, it, it, the, the, the level of suggestibility and believing it can lead us down a dangerous path. And if there's a profit motive involved, uh, <laughs> well, we know how that turns out. We've seen monster movies before. Okay. The best-known downside of cancer screening, such as PSA tests for prostate cancer and mammograms for breast cancer, is that they often flag cancers that pose no risk, leading to overdiagnosis and unnecessary, even harmful treatment. But widespread screening for scrutiny-dependent cancers, those for which the harder you look, the more you find, and the more of what you find is harmless, causes another problem, leading to Cancer experts to argue in a paper published yesterday, increasing the apparent incidence of some cancers that in turn is misleading doctors and the public about what increases people's risk of developing cancers or at least the types of cancer that matter. Detecting cancers that would never become apparent is screwing up our understanding of risk factors. Dr. H. Gilbert Walsh of the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice co-author of the analysis in Annals of Internal Medicine. And that problem is especially clear in prostate, breast, and thyroid cancers, all of which are scrutiny-dependent. It's almost like quantum, quantum mechanics. Well, not quite. But there is an old adage in quantum mechanics that things only exist because we can measure them. So if we have to dig deep and really investigate whether these cancers are there... Uh, I don't think it's quite the same, but um, now what my my family practitioner mentioned this specific issue here: men whose relatives develop prostate cancer are more likely to get PSA and other screening tests, either because they request them, or because their physicians, noting their family histories, order them. Men with no such family history are less likely to be screened. Now. We also must understand about prostate cancer. It didn't really make much of an appearance until uh, we started living a little bit longer. Prostate cancer is an old person, an old guy's disease. There are other things that killed us before we ever got a chance to get prostate cancer. And then those who may have higher uh, PSAs than what's deemed normal you know, might live 20, 30 or more years. And those that have family histories versus those who don't may be determined whether men in those families died before they had a chance 
to get prostate cancer, and that's going to skew results also. And uh, in breast cancer, women who live in neighborhoods with the highest 20% of education and income are twice as likely to be diagnosed with that disease. That seemed to confirm reports of breast cancer hotspots in some of America's wealthiest areas, leading the government and others to spend tens of millions of dollars to find out why. When the studies came up empty, they found no association between rates of breast cancer and proximity to a hazardous waste site or pesticide exposure. But wealthier, better educated women went and got more mammograms. Breast tumors found, well, of course, the women in my family, uh, my grandma died ultimately from the effects of breast cancer. My mom had it and uh, other women, you know, down through the historical lineage of our family. So th this is tough. This is tough reading here because uh, most certainly if something has been happening in your family, you, you have a natural inclination to believe that it might happen to you. All right. Breast tumors found by imaging are much more likely to be harmless than those discovered by women or the physicians finding a breast lump. Hmm. Income and education are therefore less likely to be a true risk factor for breast cancer and more likely to be a risk factor for undergoing screening. If poorer, less educated women were screened for breast cancer at the same rate as wealthier, better educated women, the socioeconomic risk factor would likely vanish. But also, I know so many poor women who have died of these cancers because they didn't get screened. It's We need to talk to Dr. Greg Dworkin about this. Let's see. Thyroid cancer cancers are also scrutiny dependent, which is why when countries launch screening programs, the incidence of the disease skyrockets. Now, of course, it's not because there's more incidences of the disease. It's always been there, but they are now able to diagnose it better. And maybe that's still important. Well, Welch and Brawley call for less focus. Uh, these are some other researchers uh, on risk factors for developing cancers, since those numbers both determine and reflect who gets screened and more on risk factors for death from cancer. Death from disease or incidence of metastatic disease is probably more accurate and appropriate, agreed Yukon's Albertson, since both are hard outcomes, not subject to what people choose to do. Oh, well, these are issues that we should uh, mull over, and we will. And we'll meet you here tomorrow uh, for uh, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays at uh, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we hope you join us. Stay tuned for the rest of the day. We've got some great content. Uh, there's some folks on the national feed still on holiday, but uh, they've got some great best ofs. Otherwise, we've got some great content uh, curated here at Netroots Radio. So stay tuned to Netroots Radio 24-7, 365. And tune in tomorrow for West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver.
Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coel Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 